Good morning, everybody. The magnifying glasses will be used later okay, as part of a demonstration. They are not to help you take closer notes or pay closer attention. Uh, they are not a comment on your age or your ability for your eyes to work or anything like that. So we will, we're going to be talking about lenses today, um, and so we'll need those when we get there. All right. Uh, but before we get to lenses, uh, I want to talk about another aspect of what, well, this is, this is really the reason, right, why everything is beautiful, or at least half the reason um, everything looks as amazing as it does. And it's called dispersion. Now, I taught you yesterday about index of refraction and kind of how it works and, and how we used it with Snell's Law, but there's a lot more going on under the surface, so to speak, and dispersion is one of those things that we do need to recognize and see for what it is. It turns out that the index of refraction is not a constant. Index of refraction depends on the wavelength and frequency of light. In other words, color. Now, in the visible portion of the spectrum, if you change the wavelength, you change the frequency, you change the color of what you are seeing or what we, what we receive. So green has a different wavelength than blue, than red, so on and so forth. And I've already given you, remember Roy G. Biv? Okay. Which of these were the high frequencies? Do you remember? Yeah, it's the ones over here in the blue indigo violet, right? These are the, the high frequencies, and so those are also the short wavelength ones. Okay, and then the opposite end is the opposite. So as we go through the colors, the index of refraction will change. And I believe it's, uh, oh, I always get this backwards. I gotta look at the graph. <clears throat> this, this, is, this is my dyslexia. Yeah, okay. On the blue end of the spectrum, the index of refraction is higher. And as we go from the, the blue indigos and violets into the oranges and yellows and reds, the index of refraction will drop. So for a given color, a given frequency of light, the index of refraction stays constant. But when you change the frequency or wavelength of that light, you will end up with a different index of refraction. We're not going to worry about the numbers here. We're always going to just either give you a singular frequency and you know, then the index of refraction is the index of refraction. But I want to talk about why this is important when it comes to how we perceive white light. White light is the combination of all of the colors of the rainbow, okay? When you overlap them in, in a projection mode. So, I don't want to get too much into this. I am not talking about like pigments used in paints. Those are reflective colors. Physicists, we, we exclusively talk about projected color. So this would be like lights projecting out of a projector or shining from a flashlight or something like that. The light comes from the sun is projected light, and the sun's light contains all of these wavelengths and all of these frequencies. It's the white light. So if we take white light and we shine it into, in this case, a prism, okay? Again, a change in medium, we're going to have refraction take place. The thing is, Refraction in Snell's law depends on the index of refraction. And so if your index of refraction changes for every color in that white light, you're going to get different angles for every color. And so that's why when light enters a prism, uh, a diamond, anything that's got cut edges like this, we're going to see this separation from one end the violets, all the way to the reds. The phenomenon of light spreading itself out into its different colors, white light spreading it out into different colors, is called dispersion. We're dispersing the, the white light into its individual colors, and the reason it's happening is because of the index of refraction being wavelength and frequency dependent. All right, let me show you some pictures because I alluded to how this makes things beautiful. So,
what's a phenomenon that you associate with seeing all of these colors? The rainbow, right? Not reading rainbow this time. Okay. But a rainbow. So a rainbow is the product of dispersion. Water droplets suspended in the air from rain or moisture or evaporation, any, any reason for there being solid water droplets in the air. If light enters that water droplet from the top, as soon as that sunlight hits that water droplet, goes through that change in medium, it's gonna to begin to disperse. There'll be refraction, refraction. That's a combination of refraction and reflection. There will be refraction and reflection at all of these things. I'm only drawing the ones that make it back out of the water droplet. Sunlight comes in, begins to disperse, bounces off the back of the water droplet, and heads out the front of the water droplet, dispersing as it goes. As that dispersion happens, the violets and the reds and all the colors in between get spread out. And if we take a whole bunch of these water droplets and add up the combination of all of those water droplets, you will see the rainbow. Rainbows are the product of changing indices of refraction because of the wavelength of light that we are talking about. Now, this is a picture that my father took of a rainbow that happened right outside. I actually, oh, I forgot to put him in. There was an astounding rainbow about a month ago in Fresno. Um, it was in the first time in a long time I had seen like enough water in the sky that the rainbow went the entire arch. I, I grabbed pictures of it and I forgot to put them in here. But um, in order to see a rainbow, you need a very specific set of circumstances to apply. Notice that in the drawing I had earlier of the droplet, okay, the sunlight has to be coming into the top of the droplet, bouncing off the back and coming back out the front. That means the sunlight has to be coming from over your shoulder. So light has to be coming from behind you, hitting water droplets, okay, that are in the air in front of you, in order for you to be able to see this phenomenon. You might have seen it, um, if you take like a hose that's got one of those mister sprayers on it and it sprays the mist into the air and it's a bright sunny day, you can see like the rainbow in the mist, that's another rainbow, right? Um, but you can see in this picture that my dad was standing in a place, the trees are just barely being illuminated by the last rays of the sun at sunset. This is when rainbows most often are observed. Again, you need the light coming kind of from behind you over your shoulder. So that's gonna happen at sunrise or sunset. Usually sunset because let's face it, most people aren't awake in the morning. And uh, usually weather is on a, uh, most weather that's gonna generate a situation where you both A, have rain droplets and B, have sun simultaneously are going to be thunderstorms. And thunderstorms require energy, and that energy needs to be built up during the day as the sun heats the, solar, the, the Earth's surface. So typically, at sunset, light coming from behind you because there's like clear breaking clouds behind you, and then you know, rain in front of you or something like that, and then you'll see that bow and that arch form. But that's not all. But wait, there's more, okay? The rainbow that you see is your rainbow. Nobody else can see it. What do I mean by that? Because I know you've been in group, oh, look at the rainbow, okay? Everybody is seeing a different rainbow. The geometry of the creation of this optical phenomenon puts you at the very apex and center of what you are seeing. Yes, other people are having sunlight come over their shoulders. And yes, you're all staring, staring at the same raindrops. But the rainbow that you see is made especially for you. Nobody else can see it because nobody can be where your eyes are. And so 
I want you to remember that the next time you see a rainbow. That's the universe's gift to you. It's made just for you. So enjoy it. Have you ever noticed that rainbows move with you? Anybody that's been driving and seen a rainbow, the rainbow will be kind of following you along. Right, okay. Or sometimes you can see rainbows like in your headlights if there's like a lot of water and there's a lot of spray that's being kicked up by the cars in front of you. You'll see you see the see the rainbows, right? Okay. And and they're just kind of moving along with you. Okay. Several things going on here. Number one, further proof that you are the center of an optical phenomenon. A very real image that's being created, but it's being created in such a way that only you can perceive it. Or let you are the center of it. But more importantly, and I think um, more concretely, it means that leprechauns are very smart about where they store their pots of gold. Right? Because the leprechauns store their pots of gold where? At the end of the rainbow. And how do you get to the end of the rainbow? You don't. Because as soon as you try to step forward, what does the rainbow do? It moves again. You will always be at the apex, right, of this optical phenomenon of the sunlight coming over and bouncing into your eyes. And yet there's more. Rainbows just keep on giving. I love rainbows. Rainbows are fantastic, okay? The bow that you see, that arch that you see, that isn't the full phenomenon. It's really a circle. Gen generally, we tend not to see the full arch because it really requires there to be like a really even spread of water droplets in front of you and nice even illumination from behind you. So we'll see like sections of it, right? And, and the reason you don't see any rainbow over here is either because there's no light over there because there's a cloud in the way or there just isn't like raindrops right there for the light to go in and come back out of. But if you can get a situation where you can get high enough and get the ground out of the way, you can actually see the entire circle. This is something that pilots see nearly every day. A pilot flying uh, above the clouds uh, can have the sun be up high in the sky, shining down, they'll see the shadow of their airplane cast on the clouds, and if there's enough water droplets there, they will see a circular rainbow in the shadow of their plane right in the middle. This is a picture that's been taken from the top of a spire or something like that. And um, you can see like it fades out right here. It's, it's kind of barely there, right? But it fades out just a little bit. Um, this is just because there's just very little light right there, right? The, the sunlight is being blocked by whatever the object is that they're taking this picture from, right? But yeah, rainbows are full circles, right? It's just sometimes we can't see that full circle. Okay, so you're at the center of this optical phenomenon. Leprechaun, leprechauns are very savvy at saving their gold and their full circles. What about the second one? Some rainbows, all well, pretty much all rainbows come as pairs. There's a primary bow and then there's a secondary bow. This picture has been um, messed with in terms of its uh, saturation of its color so that we can really see that second bow nice vibrantly, okay? But that, where does the second one come from? Well, if you caught it, I said that the primary bow comes from the sunlight entering the top of the water droplet, bouncing off and coming out the front. You wanna take any guesses as to where the second bow comes from? comes from the bottom of the drop, okay? So entering the bottom of the drop means that the light actually has to execute two bounces uh, in order for your eye to be able to see it. Again, there's lots of reflection and transmission. It's not a perfect, you know, bounce. We're not talking about total internal reflection here, not by a long shot, which is often why rainbows are faint. Not only do you have setting sun and light and all that kind of stuff, which is already fainter, but 
we have bounces happening, transmission, which causes attenuation or a decrease in the amplitude of the wave. And then we've got light escaping out the back of the raindrops, right? It's, it's absolutely incredible that any light even makes it to our eyes to see in the first place. But for the second bow, you have to do twice as many of those interactions, which means even more energy is being lost out of the raindrop. But assuming enough energy can bounce not once, but twice off of the raindrop, again, dispersing the entire time, and it does do a double reflection, which is why the order of the colors is reversed. Actually, the first one's reversed and the second one is back in the right order. You can get that second bow. The second bow is there, it's just sometimes it's too faint for your eyes to pick up. Okay. So here's a picture. Of the, again, this is unmodified. I didn't Photoshop these at all. Um, this was as natural light as I could get my dad's camera to capture it. There was a, so this isn't a raw picture, but it's a JPEG. So anybody that's done photography knows what I'm talking about. The rest of you don't care, so it doesn't matter. Um, but you can see there, okay, a reversal of colors. This one's very, very faint again, right? Nice and bright, but very faint. Again, that double bounce really kills um, that second bow. In, in reality, it can be very difficult to see what those are. I love rainbows. I was into rainbows before the rainbow guy that got millions of viewers on YouTube, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, the guy that was freaking out. Yeah, yeah. Turned out he was on mushrooms or something. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't need, I don't need physics as my drug. <laughs> right? All I need. All right. I, um, oh golly. <sighs> This might take a while. I love this stuff. I love lenses. I love eyeballs. I love corrective optics. I love. I, ah, so good. So let's let, let's let's get into this. So a lens is a device that takes advantage of Snell's law. The good news is is that we don't have to use Snell's law to figure out lenses, but it uses refraction to cause light to do our bidding. And while there are lots of different kinds of lenses out there, we are going to talk about only two of them. We're going to talk about converging lenses and diverging lenses. And the difference here is that a converging lens wants to bring light rays together. It wants to focus them down to points. Whereas a diverging lens wants to take any light that comes into it and spread it out. By its very nature, a lens is a dual optic system. In other words, there's two curvatures that are taking place here. And in these pictures, they're only showing us one focal point. But as you're about to see in the drawings that we're going, I'm going to, the ray tracing diagrams we're going to show you, there are two focal points that are very, very important. For a converging lens, So we draw them like that, okay? Do you see how it has like a curvature to it? It's again, spherical in nature. We're not reflecting light off here. There's no shiny surface. We're just light coming in and refracting. But the focal, so if on the left-hand side, I've got this curvature here, the focal point for the left-hand side is actually on the right. Again, a focal point, right? You've got to kind of curve towards it, right? Okay. And the focal point for the right-hand side of this lens would be on the left. We're always going to make sure that these two focal lengths are exactly the same. They don't have to be. In fact, if you're wearing glasses, they very definitely aren't. Okay. But the simple lens systems we'll do in here, okay, we'll make sure that the focal length is the same on both sides. But just realize that You've got that situation for a converging lens, but look at the shape of a diverging lens. This left-hand side, which side is its focal point on? Left or right? Follow the curvature. Where's the center of curvature of this left-hand side? It's on the left, right? Okay, and the right-hand side? It's on the right. These kind of follow the curvature. You're not going to have to worry too much about that, but I didn't want you to be terribly confused 
So I started throwing around focal lengths of converging and diverging lens. You're like, how do you know which side? <coughs> you know which side by following the curve of the lens. Okay. I gave you that piece of paper, right, that had the sign conventions on it. And we have a different set of sign conventions for lenses than we do for mirrors. So it's important, critical, that you understand whether a, an optics question is asking you about a spherical mirror or a spherical lens, so that you can get into the right set of sign conventions. Confusingly, there is one major change to those conventions, which is why I gave you the piece of paper so you can refer to it constantly. Okay? You're going to want this on your cheat sheet. It's just something to refer to because it can get, you can swap this very easily in your brain, okay? Notice that for mirrors, I'm not showing this on the screen, but for mirrors, when the image and object are both on the front side, we call that positive, don't we? But for a lens, look at the image. When the image forms on the front side of a lens, what do we call that? Negative. Okay, images in lenses. A lens is taking light, right? Light hits it, and then something happens on the other side. Or maybe on the same side, or whatever. There's gonna be lots of different situations. But a mirror is all about bouncing light off, which is why we can kind of keep the sign conventions the same for the front side. But for a lens, we're taking light and pushing through and doing something on the other side, and so image is positive on the back side of the lens. If images form on the front side of the lens, then they're going to be negative. Well, Mr. Bela, how do I know what side of the lens is the front side? The front side of the lens is always the side that has the object on it. Okay? By definition, that is what we are going to do. So it doesn't matter which way you draw the diagram, okay? Whatever side you put the object on is the front side of your lens. I usually, like just to kind of stay consistent with things, I will usually, if I draw a lens or anything like that, I will almost always put my objects on the left-hand side of a lens. Again, just consistently, it just maybe because I'm American or something, but going from left to right feels natural, okay? And so if this is my object, this by definition becomes the front side of my lens, okay? So if an image ends up over here, positive or negative? That would be negative because images are positive if they form on the back side of the lens. But if... If, for whatever reason, you see a diagram or a picture or anything like that, and the object's over here, now what side is the front side? It's this side, okay? And this will be your back side. So front and back are relative to what side the object is on. Which, again, you might be saying, well, Mr. Baylor, why do we say that the, how could you ever have a negative object? Like, how, if, the, if this is always the front side, then how can I have a negative object distance? Answer, you can have more than one lens. And quite often there is definitely more than one lens in an optical system, like your eyeballs, if you wear glasses, or cameras, even your cell phone camera has multiple lenses in it, okay? And the first lens can form an image, which becomes the object for another lens. It just happens to be on the back side. It gets, it gets there. But a vast majority, with two, with the two exceptions, microscopes and telescopes, we are going to use single lens systems. To the point, even when we're talking about eyeballs and corrective glasses, we're going to cheat a little bit and consider that a single lens system. Right? So, 98% of the time, your object distance is going to be positive because by definition, the front side, object side, object distance. Okay. Uh, otherwise, um, with that major change out of the way, almost the same idea with focal length. 
Converging lenses are positive focal length. Diverging lenses are negative focal length. That's the sign that's probably going to kill you. Um, you'll forget, they'll say a diverging lens in the problem, and if you put a positive focal length in, you're just gonna be messed up. So watch out for that. Uh, magnification is exactly the same. So let's talk ray tracing and what these pictures do and what they mean. So again, here's just a picture that, I don't know, orients us to the ideas, right? We've got an object, there'll be an object distance. Those distances are always measured from the vertex where the principal optical axis crosses the lens, right? This would be a positive object distance. This image has a positive image distance. How do I know that? What side is the image forming in this picture? On the back side. How do I know the back side is the right side? Because the object is on the front side, right? Um, you can see that there's some principal rays being drawn here, similar to mirrors. You go parallel and then through focal points, you go through the vertex. Again, you don't have to worry about how to make ray tracing diagrams. But how do we know that this is a real image? What's the giveaway, the telltale sign that this is a real image? Real rays are converging to a point. The rays come off of that object, get bent through the lens, and end up meeting somewhere else. Since they left the tip of the object, that must be where the tip of the image is. And real rays are present there. We can, I could go in here and I could put my hand where those rays are and I could interrupt those rays. This projector's image is a real image, right? I can interrupt the real rays of the image that's being formed on this screen. Okay? And there's lenses in that projector which are causing this to happen. The principal rays in ray tracing actually follow exactly the same rules. The difference is, is that in a diverging lens, your focal points are sort of flipped. And you want to bend away from a focal point, not towards a focal point. Again, don't get too buried into the details about where these are coming from. I'm more concerned that you can look at a picture and determine whether it's like a real image or a virtual image, upright or inverted, magnified or reduced, right? That's what a good ray trace diagram can tell you where they come from. I just wanted to point this out. On the top row are the converging lenses. And do you see how all the rays are just trying to bend towards the optical axis? Whereas for a diverging lens, they're all spreading away, okay, from that optical axis. So let's do an example of using, uh, we're gonna do uh, two examples with converging lenses. And then we're gonna do a diverging lens. So very similar to mirrors in the sense that like there were two situations where a concave mirror could generate both a real image and a virtual image. But then with the convex mirror, you could only get virtual images. Diverging lenses can only form virtual images. They can't do anything else. Again, because they're spreading rays out. And when you spread rays out, your brain is forced to follow them back to their point virtual point of where they came from, and then those images form in our brains. So let's tackle the converging lens first, and it's two different um, regimes, okay? And uh, this is why I handed out the um, magnifying glasses. Uh, who did not get a magnifying glass? Magnifying glass. You're going to do something that you probably haven't done with a magnifying glass before. You're you're welcome to stand up if you need to make space to do to make this work. Okay. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at something far away in the room. If you're in the middle, you can just look at one of these heads or something like that. Okay. 
I want you to hold the magnifying glass up at arm's length, okay? And look at something across the room. You're sitting towards the front, maybe turn around towards the back. You want to get kind of some distance between you and the thing that you're looking at. What do you see? It's upside down. So it's inverted, okay? Are your eyes wigging out just a little bit? Yes. Yeah, okay? That's because <laughs> the image that is being formed is a real image on the back side. This is the drawing for what you are doing right now. Object far away outside of the focal length of this lens. That's why I'm having you hold it at arm's length. The focal length of this lens is about right here, and I want your, I want your eyeball outside of that focal length, and I want your object way outside of that focal length, okay? Rays come in, converge, and form what kind of image? Upright or inverted? It's an inverted image. Yeah, sometimes closing one eye helps, okay? That way you're not seeing sort of a double image, right, okay? It's inverted. Is it reduced or magnified? It looks reduced, right? It, like, it looks bigger for realsies, and when you look at it through the lens, it's smaller, okay? Real or virtual? That's a real image. You are looking at a real image. Okay, now, take your magnifying glass and hold it up to your notes or your eye, like, do the standard thing you would do that I saw some of you doing, okay? Before class started, right, okay? With your magnifying glass, right? To make something look bigger, okay? Notice, what is the setup here? What are you doing? How, how close is your object to the lens now? Pretty close, okay? So what does that look like? Well, oh, this was in case I forgot my magnifying glasses, okay? <laughs> this image that you see, upright or inverted? Upright, magnified or reduced? Magnified, real or virtual? This is a virtual image. The same lens, a converging lens, can produce a real image but then also produce a virtual one. And how hard is it to tell the difference? It's hard. <laughs> you can't, right? <laughs> but one of these things is real and can be projected onto something, okay? The other is only happening in your brain. To be clear, Virtual images form because real rays strike your retina. The problem is, is those rays are diverging after they pass through the lens, and your brain has to try to follow back their paths, and your brain gets it wrong every time. It's just how we've evolved. So, just for clarity, if I'm holding my lens like this, okay, uh, uh, like this, okay, and I'm looking at the real image of the sign on the door over there, what side is the front side of this lens? It's over, it's away from my face, isn't it? It's not the side that's between my nose and the lens. It's on the other, because that's where the object is, isn't it? So where is the image forming according to this ray tracing diagram, this real image that forms? Where does it form? Somewhere between my nose and the lens, right? And that's part of the reason you were having a little bit of trouble, especially if both eyes were open, because that image is forming somewhere like right here, okay? And you're, you're having to try and focus on something that's kind of close to your face, and you're like, eh, your eyes are going, Ooh. okay? You close one eye and it gets a little bit easier for your brain to handle where that thing is, okay? But for this situation, what side is the front side of my leg? Side with my eye or the side with my hand? It's the side with my hand, right? The object is over here, right? The object is my hand, right? So the front side is way over here. Where is this image forming? In my brain. <laughs> but according to the ray tracing diagram, it's forming on the front side. So would the image distance be positive or negative for this case? 
What side is the front side of this lens? <coughs> Front side, front side is the object side. Image is appearing on the front side of the lens. What does your convention say? This better turn out to be a negative image distance. Let's do the math. Okay, let me introduce you to the lens equation. Okay, and then we'll do the math. I'm going to send around. A couple boxes. Okay. Trying to make too much noise as you turn these in, okay? But I do need my magnifying lens to stop. All right. Really complicated equation for lenses. Sorry. No, it's not you. It's not you. It, it just, it, it just, you know, it destroys the flow of class, and it just throws me off my game, and uh, how do I quit this? Whoa, what's that? Is that the train, or is that an earthquake? The answer is both, right? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Oh, it's just somebody playing music. You guys do hear the low rumble, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not just me. Sometimes it is. Play on this one. Okay, we're in luck. Oh, it's working. So hard, right? Does it look familiar? This is not a typo. It's exactly the same equation. Lenses and mirrors share exactly the same map, which is weird, but it's true. They do not share the same conventions, though. I can't stress that enough. So many students in my last two decades of teaching have been ripped to shreds by not being careful with the signs on things. So please, please, please be careful. You want to take a little guess as to what the magnification equation might be? It's exactly the same. Okay. And away we go. Okay. So let me do some examples uh, where we do this. So again, I'll use focal lengths of 15 centimeters. And let's do an object distance of 25 centimeters. So this is a case, again, this is the ray tracing diagram I have. My object is outside my focal point. I, this picture, I, so twice the focal length technically is the center of curvature of this side of the lens, but we, we, we don't ever really talk about center curvature of lenses. Center of curvature of mirrors, yes. Lenses, not really. I'm not sure why they indicated in this drawing. It's a little bit too much information. So ignore that 2F point right there. My object is outside, bigger than my focal length, so this is the ray tracing diagram I would expect. To apply, let's find the image distance. Again, the math here, I've done before, so I'm not going to do again. But before we start plugging in numbers, what are we going to check? Signs. Certain. The distance to the object, easy sign. What's it going to be? What side is the object on? Always. The front side. What's the sign for when the object is on the front side? Look at your sheet. Positive. Okay. Is this a converging or diverging lens? It's converging. You see how it's fatter in the middle? Okay. That's a lens that's converging stuff. So I'm going to put a positive on that one. So that's one over positive 15 centimeters minus one over positive 25 centimeters. 
uh, subtract them, invert them, subtract them, invert them again, and I get a positive 37.5 centimeters. Check it. Why the positive sign? What does the positive sign tell us according to the sign convention? It's on the back side. Is this image on the back side of this lens? Yes, right? The front side of the lens being the same side as the object, that means the back side of the lens is over here. So that the positive image distance is what I would expect to get according to the ray trace diagram. Okay, uh, calculate magnification. And uh, 37 versus 25, this diagram is suggesting it should be a little bit closer, but Again, I probably should have used better numbers. Um, I should, you know, technically I could have used like 40 or 50 centimeters from my object distance instead of 25, right? But anyway, uh, let's see. Magnification, negative image distance, negative 37.5 over object distance 25 gets me a negative 1.5. That's funny. Okay, negative side. What does that mean? It's inverted. Is it inverted? Yes. And is it real or is it virtual? Real. And is, does the math tell us whether it's real or virtual? No. What tells us whether it's real or virtual? The diagram. The real rays all coming together at a point tell us that that is a real image. You can test for a real image by inserting something, blocking the rays, and it prevents the image from forming. And then it's a real image. And, and you'll experience that in lab on Monday. <coughs> Excuse me. Since the magnification is 1.5, uh, how big is this image going to be compared to the object? 1.5 times as big. Again, this is a little bit off here. Um, which means that if the object was 10 centimeters tall, then the image is going to be 15 centimeters tall. I want to show you something. Um, may or may not help you understand what's going on here in real time. So there is a website, a, a collaboration, OK? Um, called FET, P-H-E-T, and um, it's, it's made by the uh, University of Colorado, and it's all about physics simulations. I'll bring it up here in a second, but, and, I, and if, you, if you email me, remind me, I'll put a link on Canvas, okay? But you can run an applet right in your browser, I've just full screened mine, okay, um, to do uh, live ray trace diagrams, okay? So we'll do lenses, okay? Um, you do need to make sure in this app that you choose principal rays. They default to something called marginal rays. Uh, don't worry about marginal rays, okay? We we'll use the principal rays, and I would really suggest that you just go with it. I mean, if you want to do a penguin, you can do a penguin, okay? But the arrow is going to be more straightforward, okay? You can grab this thing and move it wherever you want, okay? You can change rays of curve. You don't need to really change any of this stuff. You can change the diameter, make it bigger if it makes you feel better, okay? But do you see what happens as I pull this thing closer and closer to this focal point? Do you see what happens to that image? See, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if I pull it further and further away, do you see what happens to the image? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So these are all real images. How do I know they're real images? Real rays are converging to a point, right? All the way from here to here to here, there's all real images. But if I take this thing and I flip it over to the other side of the focal point, now what do I have? Do you see the dotted lines have showed up now? This is a virtual image, right? You can see the magnification of it gets bigger again as I approach that focal point, right? Okay, and then it, the, the app sort of peters out at that point, okay? <clears throat> but you can go in and, you know, do this, right, just to see, kind of play around with, and this is why when you have it way outside there, it's really small, the magnification can be less, but in the case of my example, when I have it a little bit closer, 
Do you see how that magnification is bigger? Right? So as long as I'm outside that focal point, my magnification can either be smaller or bigger, but I'm always going to get a real image no matter what, right? Okay? And then we can go in here and we can flip this to a diverging lens. Okay? I'll just show this to you now so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth on the screen. But no matter where this thing goes, do you see how that's always a virtual image? Doesn't matter, it's inside, outside, whatever. Okay? We're always going to get a virtual image. So again, if you want to email me and remind me, I'll put a link on Canvas so you can go see that. And you can have it open during your, you can't have it on the exam, <laughs> right, okay? But I, what I'm doing is I'm showing you like snapshots. I'm showing you like a snapshot of kind of like this. And the next problem we're going to do is this one. And then we're going to do this one. That's what I'm trying to show you in the pictures that uh, the ray tracing diagrams that I'm providing. Please go away. There we go. Separate. Okay. Back to that. All right. All right. So let's do the case where now we've moved the object inside of the focal length. Okay. Here's our ray tracing diagram for all objects inside focal length. Again, focal length, 15 centimeters. Object distance this time, I think I used 10. I sure did, 10 centimeters. And away we go. Let's find the image distance. Boy, this has been boring, right? D, uh, negative one. Uh, before we plug things in, check signs. The um, focal length on this one, positive or negative? What kind of lens is it? Look at its shape. It's converging. Focal length positive or negative? Positive. Positive 15 up there. Okay. And uh, object distance? Positive. It's always positive, isn't it? The object's always on the front side. If, if you've got a single lens, the object's always on the front side. Otherwise, the lens isn't doing much. 1 over positive 15 minus 1 over, uh, in this case, 10. To the negative one, all of that stuff gets me negative 30. Okay, check it. What does the negative sign mean? It's on the front. Look at your sign conventions. A negative image distance, what does that correspond to? The front side of the lens. Is the image forming on the front side of the lens? Same side as the object? Yes. Negative, we're okay. Um, and it certainly is, looks like, and this, this diagram actually worked out pretty well, if that's 10 centimeters, then that's about three times as far away, isn't it? So that's looking pretty good. Um, and then magnification, negative of a negative 30 over 10, even I can do that, that's a positive three. Positive meaning what? It's upright. Three meaning what? It's magnified three times as big, right? So if it's a 10 centimeter high object, it's gonna be a 30 centimeter high image. And again, this is the picture for a magnifying glass. This is, this is when we use a magnifying glass as intended to make things bigger, what kind of image are we seeing? It's a virtual image that is upright and magnified would be really bad if you held your magnifying glass and everything was upside down, right? Okay. How are we doing? I mean, like, compared to electric and magnetic fields, how is this stuff? Okay, is math hard? Not compared to the stuff we were doing before, right? With vectors everywhere and Pythagoreans and whatever that was going on, right? Okay. It's, just, uh, it's just really just kind of plug and chug. And the worst part is that it's all fractions, right? And we got to get used to the 1 over x key on our calculator again. Um, but the, the real, it's not even really a trap because I'm telling you about it over and over again. Where are you going to mess up? The signs. The signs. So make sure you obey those sign conventions. That, that's how you stay. Same. Relatively safe. Okay. 
Let's do the diverging lens. Okay. Hopefully it comes as no surprise at the focal length again, 15 centimeters. Uh, I chose a object distance for some reason of 35 centimeters. Um, and my diagram corresponds to that. I've got an object outside of my focal length, my object distance bigger than my focal length. I know my object distance is going to be positive. What is the focal length of this lens going to be though? What kind of lens is it? Diverging, you can tell from the picture. Okay. So the focal length here needs to have a negative sign on it. Again, be careful. They're going to try and trick you in the homework, right? They're going to say a diverging lens with focal length 15 centimeters and they won't put the sign on it, right? They told you it was diverging and so they expect you to put the correct sign into the equation. Uh, distance is I'm always solving for image distance, but of course the problems are going to be harder on you. They're going to want object distance or both or neither or something. Again, I don't know why they make them as hard as they do. Um, 1 over negative 15 minus 1 over 35, all inverted, inverted, and I got a negative 10.5 centimeters. Okay, negative sign on that image distance means what? It's on the front side of the lens. Is that what the picture says? Sure does. Uh, 10.5 is less than 35, so I'm liking my drawing. And magnification, negative, negative 10.5 over 35 gets me a magnification of 0.3. Positive magnification means what? Upright. My image is upright. The only way to tell that it's virtual or real is to look at the diagram. What is it? I mean, the diagram says virtual, right? But how do you know it's virtual? This one's kind of interesting because do you see how there's a real ray? passing right past the tip of that image, but there's also a virtual ray. One ray is not enough. If you see one real ray and then a virtual ray, it's still a virtual image. For a real image to form, you got at least two real rays converging at that point. And it's a diverging lens. It's always gonna make a virtual image. And throughout all of these examples, I don't know if you've caught on, and I kind of told you this before, like 95% of the time, if your image is upright, it's, it's a virtual image, okay? In a single mirror or single lens situation, nearly guaranteed, upright image, it's gonna be virtual. If it's inverted, 95% of the time it's gonna be. What about that other 5%? You really don't need to worry about it because it's the region of very special cases that we don't concern ourselves with in physics. Too weak. All right. But once we move into double systems or, or multiple optics in a system, okay, then things can change. Did I give you a multiple lens system in the homework? That wasn't a telescope or a microscope? I might have. I don't remember. I really shouldn't do my homework assignment. Um, <laughs> the problem is I did them all back in the summer. Uh, or at the winter break, rather. Um, so, what's going on here? Okay, so, do you see how the object, in that top drawing, the object there's two lenses between the object and where that person is seeing it. So what happens is the first lens makes what kind of image? They're even telling us right there. It makes a real image. See how the rays come together and converge? But then the second lens makes, takes that real image, makes it a real object, and forms a virtual image of a real image, which is the object. <coughs> When you have more than one lens, it gets rougher, okay? The way that you approach it is you approach it one lens at a time. Start with the lens that's closest to the object, which is always referred to as the objective lens. Why is it called the objective lens? It's closest to the object, okay? 
The other lens is called the eyepiece. Why is it called the eyepiece? It's closest to the eyeball, okay? We're only ever gonna show you two, okay? But if there's more than the ones in between are called the interstitial lenses. Fancy word for in-between stuff, okay? So, you start with the objective lens, the one's close to the other. Look at that diagram, ignore the other lens, do that diagram, figure out if it's real or virtual, do the math. And then once you know where that is, that image, real or virtual, becomes the object for the second eyepiece lens. Then you do it again, okay? So they're trying to show you here in this bottom diagram how they're separating out the two parts, right? And they're taking that first image, making it the object for that lens. Remember, distances are always measured from the lens itself. So even though you find the image distance in the first lens, you gotta correct and find the object distance because hopefully you'll know the separation between them. And this is why we have the conventions the way that we do, because there is there are situations where you can end up <laughs> with the image from the first objective lens on the back side of the eyepiece. And now you have a negative object distance because it's not on the correct side, on the back side. Okay. Don't worry about it too much. All right. If I gave you a multiple lens system, I gave you a very easy one to get through. Um, the ones that I'm really going to require you to know about are microscopes and telescopes, and we're going to get to that not today, but probably on Thursday. Okay. Um, those are true multiple optical systems with very specific applications I want you to know about and appreciate. So we'll get into that. Okay, so with our newfound insights and knowledge and skill in dealing with lenses, we can now talk about all the cool parts about lenses because we have two of them built right into our faces that cause really cool things to happen, okay? Some of us require corrective lenses to be sitting either on the surface of our eyeballs or on the surface of our face, right? To be able to see what's going on. So we gotta talk about that. We've got lenses in our devices more or less everywhere now, right? So that we can record the world and put it on whatever social media we think people are paying attention to. <laughs> Optical systems are everywhere everywhere and we're gonna we're gonna see how all of the physics that we know applies and we're gonna start with cameras as an approximation of what the human eyeball is kind of doing we'll get to human eyeballs in a little bit okay but we got to talk about what cameras do now of course I'm old and so when I think camera I think actual device <laughs> right okay and uh, oh, oh let me go one second I forgot my box of goodies. So, this is a camera lens, okay? That would go on a camera body, right? I'm gonna send this one around. You're trying not to drop it, but you're more than welcome to, to, to like play around with the zoom function. And we're gonna talk about this in a second, but there's also an aperture, so you can see here what the aperture is doing. You gotta depress the little metal button on the top to get it to rotate, otherwise it locks. So we'll send that one around so everybody can see that one. Uh, I got another one here. This one's not a not a zoom, it's a macro lens, but you can really see the aperture of this one, and it's broken, so you don't have to push the button down. So we'll send that around so people can see. So those are camera lenses. Is there, you know, cameras on them died. I got, I got all kinds of. <laughs> That's what I used to look like. <laughs> right? uh, back before I had my eyes uh, blasted with laser beams. Um, so yeah. Anyway, like, oh, there's the original. <laughs> Oh, gee, Mr. Bailey. Okay. Um, Are those the 
<laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> I've got like this. This is the original. These are. Yeah, these were the next gen, and then I think these were the most recent ones I don't have to wear anymore. I mean, I was really blind. Ah. <laughs> Really hard correction on those. Um, we'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, or Thursday. So it depends on how long I talk about cameras. I love cameras. Um, I, I I was the I was one of the yearbook photographers um, in high school, um, and uh, I had to go to football games. Um, yeah. I didn't like it. <laughs> Um, so, because they needed pictures of football players for the yearbook. I never understood why. Why don't they want pictures of nerds? So what does a camera do? Object, capture object onto something. The whole point, right, okay, is to create an image that we can save. Save onto a piece of film, save onto a piece of digital medium, it doesn't matter. Nowadays, we don't use film, we use, um, uh, charge couple devices that capture the electrons and to do our bidding, okay? But key to understanding how this optical system worked is the interplay between the aperture and what's going on with the image. So I'm gonna give you some insight on how to take good pictures now. So, so if you don't take notes about anything, okay? Take notes on this, because this is going to change your life. Okay, you will all of a sudden go from people going, oh, that's a nice picture, and you realize that they don't care, okay, <laughs> to, oh my gosh, that's a great picture, how did you take that? You're so good at photography, okay? You just have to manipulate their brains, okay? And I'll show you how to manipulate their brains. Well, let's first start with aperture, okay? Our eyes do this with our pupils. Okay, we, we, we automatically adjust the aperture, and the aperture adjusts to either let very little light in or a whole bunch of light in. And we need to be able to adjust, because sometimes we go out in the sun and we go, oh, yeah, it's touching, right? <laughs> or like we're in a dark room and we need to be able to see in that low light. It's a, so a camera does the same thing. It just approximates it with that aperture inside of there, okay? And this can have interesting results on the optical system and the properties of the pictures that you get out. Um, I'll let you know if any of these are my pictures. I don't think any of them are. Uh, I'll let you know if I see one. This one's definitely not mine, because I would never take a picture like this. It's a dumb picture, okay? <laughs> but the person took it to show you the effect of aperture on the quality of the picture that you are taking. In this picture, the aperture of this camera has been tightened down a lot. There's a, something called an f-stop in photography, and the, the lower the number, the wider open. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's weird, but anyway, your f number, your f-stop, like a 2.5 or 2.8 is like a wide open, letting lots of light in. And then as the number gets bigger and bigger, 10, 15, 30, it scrunches down and becomes narrow, okay? So you're using, usually using very high f-stops for like landscape photography where the sun is shining brightly and all that kind of stuff, okay? But the aperture will affect something called depth of field in a picture. The reason this picture isn't very good is because it's very boring. And the reason it's very boring is there's nothing exciting going on in the picture. And your brain is not drawn to any particular thing in this picture. Because everything in this picture is in focus. The depth of field, the range over which this image is in focus, is very long. In other words, the houses in the distance, the cars, the bush, and the brick walls that are right here, are all in focus. And that depth of field comes from having a very small aperture in the lens. Compare and contrast the artistic nature of this picture with this one. This is a more interesting picture. Notice it's not real, I mean, that's a dead flower. Who wants to look at a dead flower, right? But what is the trick 
that the photographer is taking advantage of to clue your brain into what you should be looking at. Focus. The depth of field in this picture is very narrow, meaning that it's the flower that is in focus. The background has all been blurred out. Do you see that? This is naturally occurring in this picture, not because of some algorithm that does it, okay? But naturally you can do this by widening that aperture. That causes the depth of field to be very short, meaning that there's only a narrow range where things will be in focus. If you want to communicate to somebody the intent of your photograph, one of the primary ways you're gonna do that is by playing with depth of field. In modern cell phones, this is called portrait mode, okay? You flip your phone to portrait mode, and if you've ever played with it, you'll notice that it'll start trying to track your face. Because in portrait mode, when you take a portrait of somebody, What's the important part of the photograph? Somebody. The somebody, right? The background shouldn't matter at all. That's why when somebody takes a portrait photograph and the picture, the person's in focus and the thing behind them is in focus, I'm like, that's a terrible picture. And my mother-in-law gets really upset. <laughs> You want to blur that background out. In the old days, we did it by physically changing the f-stop on our lens to let in as much light as possible, which means our shutter speeds have to be right, all that kind of stuff, in order to get that depth of focus to be very narrow. How many of you have ever gone to the eye doctor where they've dilated your pupils and you've lost the ability to see anything? Okay, yeah, those of us that have had glasses know what I'm talking about, okay? They dilated your pupils and forced the muscles in your eyes to fully extend your pupil. Now your aperture is big. So what happened to your ability to focus? It's out the door, right? Because your depth of field now is very narrow. You just kind of got to sit there with your own thoughts for a while, as terrifying <laughs> as that may be, right? You got to sit there because you can't read anything, you can't look at your phone, you can't do anything, okay? You gotta wait for the, for the medicine to let your eyeballs back, okay? <laughs> let your pupils go back down. Because a, because a tightened pupil has a much longer depth of field. Same thing's going on in camera. In cell phones, the artificial portrait mode is using machine learning to detect what's supposed to be in focus and what should be blurred out, and then they send the blurring Gaussian algorithm all over that, right, okay? But you can trick it. You can say, I want this thing to be in focus and the person not. You can do all kinds of clever things with your phone if you learn how to do it. But if you want to take good pictures of people, if you want to take good pictures of your pets, if you want to take good pictures of your food, which I don't understand. Why are people taking pictures of your food? Anyway, use portrait mode. Tap on the screen to tell the camera the thing you want to be in focus. You want it to be your doggy's cute nose, right? Okay? And then it'll just kind of blur everything out. And when you post that on Instagram, people are going, oh, what a cute picture of your doggy. If you don't do that, they'll just see the doggy on the floor and your dirty laundry, whatever else is in the picture. Okay? And it will, you're, they'll say, oh, it's a cute picture of a puppy, but their brain will be going, this is a boring picture. Because we br brain wants only one thing to focus on. So give it one thing. Take advantage of people's attention deficit disorder. <laughs> All right. This is a really dumb photograph, but it's showing depth of field again, okay? Like, in terms of composition and stuff, it's stupid. But look, that coin and the first few matchsticks are the things that are in focus, right? Everything else is out of focus. This is a very narrow depth of field. Compare and contrast that with this picture, which I know is not as bright, it's because of the aperture's change. But do you see how all of the matches are now in focus? This is a bigger depth of field. Again, if you're using a real camera, you control this by changing the aperture. If you're using a cell phone, you're using portrait mode. Okay, here's the other trick that you need to know about 
uh, taking pictures, okay? And this will just like totally up your game, okay, when taking pictures. I'm gonna hand my phone to somebody. You don't have to hold it, but what is, what is my phone doing that yours might not be doing in taking a picture? Do you notice? Or does your phone do this? No, you don't, you don't see it? Give the lines. The lines. So my phone has two lines going, dividing the field into thirds, top to bottom, and then two lines, again, dividing into thirds. Okay, your, your phone should have this capability. Your camera app should be in the setting somewhere, okay? It might say grid, it might say rule of thirds, it might be called that, because this is taking advantage of something called the rule of thirds. And I didn't put any pictures in the slides so I could show this, okay? But if you take a picture So here's your camera screen, okay? And um, you're taking a picture of a person, let's say, okay? Most people will just hold the camera up and stick the person right in the center. I'm taking a picture of a person, right? There's the thing they're ready to do. Don't do that. <laughs> Put, and, and, and I don't wanna to teach too much of an art class here, but, Put, uh, put the person at an intersection, one of these points where the grid overlaps, okay? Put, and, and, and pick, pick, like maybe you wanna see more of their body, so you put their face up here, right, okay? There's actually some really intriguing psychology about where a person's face is located, like, like if it's kind of down here and there's maybe like a tree blurred out back here, the suggestion is, is that's a more uplifting photograph than a person's up here in their body and something else over. Anyway, okay, I don't want to get too far into the woods on this one. The simple version of the rule of thirds is put your subject at one of these intersections. If your dog is looking up at you and they're looking this way, put them down here looking up into this space, which is gonna be blurred out because you can have it in portrait mode, right? Okay. If you're taking a picture of a mountain, okay, and there's some beautiful clouds, okay, then what you wanna do is you want the clouds up here and you want the mountain down here. You don't want the mountain in the center. The rule of thirds takes advantage of a trick, uh, manipulation of perception in our brains. For some reason, when our attention is drawn to something that's at one of these four points, our brains will go, ah. And you can get like absolute bonus points from people that, oh, that's such a good picture. Versus if you just took a picture of the mountain right in the center. Especially if it's like El Capitan in Vernal Falls. Oh my gosh. I go to Yosemite and all people at the tunnel view, right? Everybody's taking their pictures. I just want to run around and grab their cameras. <laughs> right? And like, stop it! Don't, don't put it there! Frame it correctly. Do you have a zoom function? Use it. Put it at the rule of thirds, right? People hand me their camera, and I take a picture for me. I'm like, okay. And I will stick them down in the corner, and then I'll take another picture. Right, of them in the center, and I'll hand it back and I'll say, which of those two pictures do you like better? And I'll take more like that. Unless it's my mother-in-law, they will say, okay, that they like this picture more. 100%, my mother-in-law thought, oh, it's gonna be right in the middle. I'm like, yeah! Okay, I do what she says, I love her, she's a great person, but like, come on, okay? So, two ways to really improve your game on social media. Okay? Portrait mode, rule of thirds. You do that, you're gonna be amazing. I will see you on Thursday, unless I have jury duty. But I will let you know by next, that's the case. Thank you. But is that true?